So the truth is, when it comes to our call, you have to decide who are you going to listen to. Are you going to listen to the opinions of others? Are you going to listen to your parents? How many of you are doing exactly right now what your parents wanted you to do when you got out of one? And, and the truth is, the only thing he's doing is lying. I, is that you're lying, aren't you? Yes, he's absolutely lying. Yep. So today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9 and talk about... I had a donut. Don't tell Kristen. Can you hold your mom's ears real quick? Just Yeah, donut. It was good. It had chocolate on the top. Oh, it's good. It's so good. There's a few more donuts left. By the way, if you don't have a seat, the kid's left, so there's room up here now. I don't know, we're going to start sitting the kids on the roof or something. So, but I'm glad to have them in here and then, they, you know, part of the service a little bit so that this is not a separate church for them, you know. By the way, Howie, great job, substitute drummer today. <laughs> Praying for all our other drummers. By the way, I'm a drummer. Do I need to be worried about my health at this point? So... We're praying for Don, especially as he recovers from back surgery, but we're glad to see you guys today. So I got the joy of going to the wonderful, wonderful city of Tampa. I thought Miami was my least favorite city to drive to, but I've changed my mind <laughs> because I-4 is literally the only road that goes to Tampa. There is a couple of other roads that have cows on them, but they don't go straight. They go in circles. It's like being in the mountains in North Carolina. So we drove to uh, uh, Tampa this week and drove early in the afternoon thinking we would miss traffic. <laughs> At one point, I was driving and there was construction on the way there. And so, so the GPS thought I was off the road. And so it told me to go off the exit and get back on. And so smart one of the few smart things I did is I ignored it. I said, GPS just doesn't know where I am. It's trying to divert me off the road. Have you guys had that happen? Yeah, it was setting me up. <laughs> because on the way home, we decided two in the morning, we would head home so we would miss traffic. <laughs> Kristen, asleep. She's out. The GPS... It's telling me on the way home, still green, but it did the same thing again. It, it looked like it was telling me to get off, and then I looked, and it was right back on I-4, and I thought, well, that's dumb. It's doing the dumb thing again. I'm going to ignore that. So at about 2.30, I think, in the morning, 3 o'clock, I don't know what time it was, misery time, I went past that exit. As I passed that exit, instantly 40 minutes was added to the time on my GPS, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> I debated. Don't tell my insurance agent who's sitting in the sixth row. I debated about pulling over in the right lane and just reversing for a quarter mile. But I thought, it can't be 40 minutes bad. <laughs> They decided to take I-4 from three lanes to one lane, and somebody decided to get in an accident right where it went to one lane. So there we sat. But that wasn't the worst part. <clears throat> no, no. Nay, nay. The worst part was that Kristen was sleeping soundly. No, that's not the worst part either, although very true, to the point that I almost wanted to go, hey, look at this traffic, huh? I tried to slam on the brakes extra hard a couple of times just to emphasize that. But we were going so slow that even doing that didn't help. Somebody, of course, near me had their radio super loud. That was such a joy. Thank you for sharing your radio with me. And your taste in music is horrible. <laughs> you ever done that at the gas station? They're trying to share their radio with you. You're like, thank you. so. Don't you wish you had a Mr. Microphone at that point? Remember Mr. Microphone? Hey, girls, I'll pick you up at eight. Remember that commercial? <clears throat> Donut. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was I realized that it wasn't getting me off of I-4 and back on I-4. It was showing me that there was a little road on the other side of a wall that they built specifically to keep people trapped on I-4 from getting away, like McDonald's does in their drive through now. So there's a wall, and every minute 
I would see on that little road, a car just zip by us. 40, 50 mile an hour, swing. I saw people I passed because it was a tow truck towing a truck that I had passed a half hour earlier that I saw on the other side of the wall. Zoom. And I thought, if only I had listened when it was time to listen. If only I had listened as I got to that area and had said, you know, maybe the GPS knows what it's talking about then I would be home instead of still driving for hours. It was misery. And the truth is, if we're not careful, if we miss the voice of God in our lives, if we just pursue what we want to pursue, we will miss out on the joy of the Christian life. We'll miss out on the joy that God has for us. We'll miss out on the calling that God has for us and be stuck in traffic when God has a specific call for us where we can change people's lives. And when you begin to do that and understand that God is calling you every day to be sensitive to what he wants you to do, to to pay attention to how God can use you every day, when you recognize that, it gives you joy. Some of you have lost your purpose in life because you've forgotten that. You, you, God called you and said, get off here. And you went, nope. Why is everybody passing me? And so today I want to talk about three things about being called. And we're going to look at this Matthew chapter 9 where Matthew talks about his calling and kind of what comes out of that. And we're just going to look at three parts of God's calling. There's a lot more to it, but I think these are really good things to remember that God has called us to do a few things. So we're going to look at those today. Number one, he's called us to leave our old life behind. Remember me talking to the kids a minute ago? Some of you got hurt as children. Somebody hurt you. And you were too young to defend yourself or to take care of yourself or to speak up for yourself. And you're still carrying that around. Some of you did something dumb when you were younger or this week or this morning, 10 minutes ago. You can apologize in church. Go ahead. All right. And you're still carrying it around and you're having a hard time leaving it behind. And listen to what happened with Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, 9 to 13. By the way, Matthew is the least known disciple. But here's what we know about him. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Other places, it's also called Levi. It's okay to have more than one name. I have students that called me Mr. Brooklyn. They couldn't say Brookins, apparently, so they went with Brooklyn. I'm also Mr. B. I'm also Inertia Dude. You may not know that. Sitting, they saw Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, which is awesome, Matthew follows Jesus and says, let's eat. My house is just up the road. And so Matthew leaves the the tax collector's booth. By the way, they would set up a booth on the road and pretty much get to charge whatever they wanted. And Roman soldiers were there to enforce it. So, I mean, they they were hated. Tax collectors were absolutely hated. And I'm going to show you how we know that too, okay? So many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Time out. Why does it separate tax collectors and sinners? Oh, oh, you're going to find out. Because sinners were bad. People who killed people, people who stole from people, uh, prostitutes. I mean, they were bad. That was sinners. But even worse, worse than a sinner. By the way, we have a tax collector that goes here to church. Worse than a sinner. Tax collector. Because they worked for Rome. They had Roman soldiers and forces. They were traitors. By the way, you are not a traitor. We love you. Random citizen. Did you know that movie? Okay. Then he says this. 
When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Which, I don't know, if you're one of the sinners or tax collectors, you're like, what? But then he continues, But go and learn what this means. Now, I love this. Jesus is talking to the religious teachers. The ones who think they're experts. They call themselves experts. They call themselves experts, if that tells you anything about them. And Jesus says, it's almost a little sarcastic, hey, why don't you go learn what this means? And then he says this, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. See, that's from Hosea 6.6. 6. They would have heard that verse. They would have known that verse. They would have been totally insulted. But this is what Jesus said to them. Whenever people say, what was so bad about the Pharisees and Sadducees? Jesus early on, right here, diagnoses what's wrong with them. They care about outward sacrifice that looks spiritual, but they don't actually care about people. For I have come to call, excuse me, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And I really think that what Jesus is saying is people who know they're sinners. See, the big deal is not whether you're a hypocrite or not. Hypocrite means actor. So the big deal is, do you know you're messed up? If you know you're messed up, you're no longer a hypocrite. We were talking this morning in Sunday school about them serving pizza at one of the local workout places. What? They do what? They serve pizza. One of the guys told us he went to a Weight Watchers meeting and they served cake. What? As long as you recognize I'm messed up, you're no longer a hypocrite. Because hypocrite means actor. So the minute that you say, I'm messed up, you're no longer messed up. It's Ferris Bueller when he looks at the camera and goes, get it? When you recognize that you don't have your act together. And Jesus says, I've come to call those people who know they don't have their act together. Now, I know that if you're under 40, you have no idea what this is. I even have little puppies printed on mine. This is a check. This is a check. So, so Ricky, this is a check. Let me, let me. This is Venmo. So imagine if I did my Venmo, I signed in on my Venmo, I put in your name, and then I said, whatever amount you want, just type it in. Oh, yeah, exactly. We used to call that a blank check. Now we call that crazy. <laughs> right? And some of you are like, that's not crazy. I've got 12 cents in my account. No problem. Right? So, so here's the deal. When Jesus calls us, what Matthew did is what Jesus calls us to do. Matthew said, what do you want me to do? Follow you? Fine. He left his old way of life behind. It didn't mean that he didn't have this time. He was called by God. Your calling is not your job. Your calling may involve your job, but it's not your job. Your calling is every day saying, God, what do you want me to do? What do I have to leave behind to follow you? Is it sin? Is it regret? Hey, there's some good things to leave behind. Regret's a good thing to leave behind. Sin habits are a great thing to leave behind. Sadness, depression, discouragement. Those are great things to leave behind. God, I want to follow you. Would you help me to put those things in the past and put them in the past? Paul says this in Philippians 3. I read it earlier. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Boy, don't you wish you could always forget what was behind. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Because here's the truth. If you focus on the hurts of the past, you'll only think about them. But if you focus on what God wants you to do next, then you can start to leave the past in the past. If you're on a diet, don't focus on the food you don't want to eat. Bacon. 
If you'll notice, when Adam and Eve messed up, one of the things it says is they noticed how good the fruit looked. Do you know how they noticed how good the fruit looked? Because God said, one tree don't eat off of. And guess where they're hanging out? Fruit looks good, doesn't it? Mmm, it's appealing to the eye. It looks delicious. Don't you think it's delicious? Me thinks delicious too. And if we're not careful, we'll focus on all the things that we should leave behind. And that includes things where we messed up and blew it. And sometimes you just have to say, I can't continue to focus on that, God. I repent. I turn that over to you. Would you help me to press forward? And how do you do that? You say, God, what do you want me to do today? Because if you're always looking back, you can't focus on what God wants you to do. You're not going to help anyone if all you're thinking of is yourself. If all you're thinking of is your failures, if all you're thinking of is what you've done wrong and how you've messed up in your life and how someone hurt you, if all you're thinking of is those things, you won't be able today to pursue what God wants you to do today. Now, Eric, are you saying I can't look back at all? No, but just glance back. Rearview mirror. Please don't drive looking in the rearview mirror or at your phone. <clears throat> at your phone. Number two, called to his expectations, not others. So I changed my illustration for this one. I like it better. So my phone, I, I get a lot of calls. I know that's a shocker to people. But if you're a pastor, you get a lot of phone calls. So what I've done is people who are my favorites and people who are my friends, I have specific ringtones for them. I have also learned that if somebody group texts me, I just turn their sound off. And then I don't hear their group text. So if you group text me and you want me to hear your message, I'm not going to hear your message anymore ever again. Now I'll see it eventually, but you're not going to wake me up at three o'clock in the morning with the 42 people you group text and put me in. Did I say all of that out loud? Some of that was meant to stay inside. So when my wife calls me, when my daughter calls me, I have no idea who this one is. I just like this song. I didn't even know I had this on here. That's a good one. So now when Kristen calls me, it's going to say it's your daughter. All right. So I have different ringtones for my different kids. So I actually know who is calling me when, and I know when it's somebody else. We were sitting at men's group, and somebody's phone went off, and it said, hello, Moto. And I instantly knew which old person at this table. <laughs> he just looked at me like, you calling me old? Because nobody 30 years old has that ringtone. Am I wrong? I'm pretty correct. Hello, I'm going to change mine to Hello Moto now. All right. So, so here's the deal. I know who's calling me and when. Listen, when it comes to calling, you need to know who's calling you. Are you listening to the expectations of other people? Are you listening to voices from your childhood of what you should and shouldn't be or how you felt about yourself or how other people treated you? Or are you saying, God, what do you want me to do? And listening for God's call on your life. If you think you're the only one, listen to this. This is one of the first interactions that Matthew hears when it comes to Jesus. And here it is. Then Verse 14, then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Basically, John's disciples are like, we agree with the Pharisees on this one. Why are you guys not fasting? Why aren't you doing what we do? Why don't you do things the way we do them? Why don't you vote the way we vote? Why don't you do the things the way we do them? You're not doing what we think you ought to do. And here's how Jesus answers. How can the guests of the bride's room mourn while he's with them? The time will come where the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. I have no idea what that means 
other than you don't put old milk with new milk. How's that? If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskin, and both are preserved. What's Jesus saying? Every person needs to do what God's called them to do. And when it comes to the essentials, we have unity. When it comes to non-essentials, we have diversity. And when it comes to all things, we should be loving towards each other. So we're the, to, towards each other. So where the Bible is clear, we should be clear. This is right and this is wrong. But when the Bible is not clear about right and wrong, it's okay to have differences. My mom does not drink any alcohol. She does not touch alcohol. She does not look at alcohol. She doesn't want anything to do with alcohol. I put white wine on chicken. I don't tell her, right? Because she grew up in a home with an alcoholic. She grew up in that. So for her, she doesn't want anything like that around. But there's other people who have wine with dinner. And so when I talk to them and they say, hey, I'm having so-and-so over the house. Should I have wine with dinner? I said, are they a a, a person? Yes. Then no. Some of you can't go to a bar because you struggle with drinking. Others of you, man, TGI Fridays, no big deal. You're going to have nachos and one beer and no big deal. But some of you are like, Eric, did you just say beer in church? Because we're different. And so do what God's called you to do. Be sensitive to who you are and how God made you. You ready for this? Some people think hymns are the best thing ever. Some people think hymns are the worst thing ever. Some people think that hymns are old and they've never heard of Gregorian chants. Some people think that new songs are repetitive and they forgot all about the Hallelujah Chorus. Did you know it's repetitive? And it's old. So it's not old or new. What is it? It has to do with your preferences. And it's okay for your preferences to be different than someone else's. And you still celebrate what they're doing. John's disciples are missing out on the Jesus that they were prepared to usher in. Because they're worried about, why are you eating? Are you missing out on fellowship with another believer over some disputable matter, something that doesn't matter? Make sure that who you're answering is God. Who's more important, a pastor with 50 people in his congregation or a pastor with 10,000 people in his congregation? Neither and both. We have to be careful that the voices that we hear. So what is the enemy going to do? He's going to say, because you don't have this or you don't have that, you're less than. What do you mean you don't have kids? You don't have kids? Well, then you're not as important as that person with kids. You don't have this job? Well, you're not as important as that person with this job. You don't have this? Well, then you're not as important as that person. Listen, don't let the enemy tell you that you need to be somebody else. Be, you ready, who God wants you to be. And do what God's called you to do. It's the only way you can bless people. C.S. Lewis said this, God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. Number three, call to lead others home to Christ. I love our men's group. We have men's group now. We're meeting at Kay's Barbecue on Wednesday mornings at 730. So if you want to come, come on. It's early. One of the cool things was one of our men needed some help with a neighbor. And so after group, he called one of the other men and said, hey, I can't help this person with this. And the person, oh, I can help with that. And they got excited about being able to help somebody who needed help. Where one person couldn't do it, somebody else could do it together. Listen, when you go out of your way to bless somebody, God uses it to encourage you. Is there anybody you're praying for? Is there anybody you're praying in your family to come to know Christ? Did you know your family is your hardest ministry? So sometimes all you can do is pray for them. They're not going to listen to you anymore. They've heard all your speeches. So it's time for you to just pray and be quiet. 
Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, verse 20, came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Listen to what Jesus says next. Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. Time out. You know what Jesus was saying to her? It's not about the coat. What if she had missed and touched his shoe? What if she had messed up and not done what she was supposed to do? What mattered in this scenario, you ready? Was not the specific prayer. It was not the specific act. It was faith. Be careful when somebody tells you, you have to pray exactly like this for God to answer it. Because we're all special needs children that God loves and listens to. I have a special needs daughter, and when she talks, I don't go, you didn't say that right, try again. No, I say, whatever you want. By the way, if you have a special needs child, you know that's the problem with special needs kids. Sometimes you're like, yeah, sure. And we are all special needs children, and when we cry out to God in faith, God listens. Who are you praying for in faith? What are you praying for in faith right now? It wasn't the fringe of the coat, it was the faith. A few verses later, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. Does that sound like our world today? Like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest field. And I believe that Jesus is looking around at his disciples and going, <clears throat> that's you too. Too often we're praying for people to be sent into the harvest field when the truth is we also need to be praying on what harvest field we need to go into. What is God calling for you to do? Now you may think, oh, Eric, I'm not important enough. Eric, I don't know how to talk the way you talk. That's probably a good thing, by the way. Eric, I don't know how to do the things. I can't sing. I can't do this. I can't do that. You use the gifts God's given you. Yesterday on Facebook, I saw a perfect example of somebody using their gifts. One of the ladies that I've known for years and years posted a picture. Ugliest picture I've seen in a long time. It was a plastic bottle with weeds in the plastic bottle with a little dandelion looking thing on top. And I thought, what is this about? And then I read it. She said, these are the most beautiful flowers because my grandson gave them to me. When you do what God's called you to do, even if you don't feel like you do it very well, even if you feel like you don't love people very well, you don't encourage people well, hey, maybe you have the gift of making soup, then give soup for Jesus. Maybe you have the gift of writing notes of encouragement, then write notes of encouragement for Jesus. Maybe you have the gift of giving people secret gifts. Well, give them a gift in Jesus' name. Send it to them in the mail. Leave it on their porch. Have Amazon ship it to their house. It's wonderful. You can do that now. It takes 12 clicks in about three minutes. Whatever God's calling you to do, just do it and let it be like flowers from a grandchildren to their grandmother. He's thankful when you use your gifts. God is calling you. He's calling you every day into what he's asking you to do. Don't let the opinions of others affect you. Leave the past behind and just ask him today, God, what do you want me to do? And then do it. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, today I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ. I know about him. I've heard about Jesus, but I've never surrendered my life to him. I want to do that today. And so I'd love to talk to you after the service about the fact that Jesus died and rose again to take your sins. We're messed up. Or maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, and the truth is you've been focused on the wrong things. It's okay. It's time to leave the tax collector's booth and say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength. I thank you that you use weak People, You use people that the world thinks are useless. You use people that are broken and messed up. And Lord, in the middle of all of that, you absolutely love us. So Father, may we receive your love today, but not only receive it, but give it away. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.